right. Well, I think we just start our uh, first podcast here. All We're right, recording. Let's go. We're recording. We've been recording the whole time. So, um, so well, welcome to the Movement is Medicine podcast, episode one, with uh, myself, Kevin Carr, and Brendan Rierick, my lovely co-host on the West Coast. Hello, Kevin. Good morning. Yeah. Well, this is our first episode. And uh, we're very excited because this is something that we've discussed and uh, I've discussed for a while. And we finally just thought this was a good excuse for us to hang out every week and talk. And I hope that uh, whoever's out there listening, if there is anybody other than our parents and our significant others, that you enjoy the time that we we're going to try to do this every single week, the time that we spend together. How do we want to start this off? Well, I mean, I think that it would be good to kind of discuss... Uh, <clears throat> You know, what, what do we want to do with this uh, new project and yeah. what do we want to get out of it and um, kind of like what our plan is going forward. So, um, yeah, if you want to start well, to what, what do you want it to be about? What do you want to talk about every week? The discussion that we had was the idea of it being that we will we bring our previous and current experience into the fold, but also a big thing for me that I think that there's a, there's a lack in both the fitness industry, but in most industries is that there isn't enough of the other side or, or the, the overarching view of both sides. And like, here's what one camp would say. This is what the other camp would say. This is what I believe. And then leave the choice up to you. And I think precision nutrition does the best job of this. They, when they write an article, they present the research of both sides. They present what they've experienced with all the clients they've coached. And then they share what they think or what their recommendation would be. And then they leave it up to the consumer or the user to then make their decision. So I told you, I like the idea of putting on different hats, right? So there's the, the trainer hat, the research hat, the what uh, other people might think hat or what I know from my experience hat. Uh, there's the rehab hat. There's a bunch of different hats that we can put on. And I want to make sure that we put on all of those hats and then leave the decision up to the listener. Um, so that's what I'm envisioning for this. And that means each week we'll have a topic or two to discuss. If there's a topic or a question that we get that we know somebody uh, that is a content expert, we will invite that person on to help with the discussion or to provide a different view or a different perspective. Cause uh, I think you and I both realize that we, uh, we think very much alike and we live in the same bubble and it would be good to get people outside of that bubble to, to fill in maybe some gaps that we have. So that's what I'm envisioning. Uh, I, I don't want it to be three hours either. I don't think you do <laughs> either. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I think we're going with this and, I don't know if you have anything to add or if you disagree with me completely, please do. Oh, you mean you want to have a uh, balanced perspective on uh, different topics within the fitness industry? How, uh, uh, how controversial. Yeah, how I mean. ironic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I think that it's important to have longer form conversations outside of a tweet or outside of an Instagram yeah. caption that can give an actual practical perspective on all the different things that our clients want to know or that other coaches might have questions about or unsure about. Um, and from a selfish perspective on my front, um, with you, like this is, these are conversations you and I would typically have together if we were in the same room, like on a daily basis. These are the things that I might talk to Steve Bigelow about at work, or I talk to Vinny, or I talk to Dan um, on a daily basis, but you and I, it's harder for you and I to do that now as we are 3000 miles apart. So um, it's for me, I think it's valuable to just to have conversations out loud with someone else um, who I know I share a lot of perspectives with and who might be able to give their own insights. So um, I think it's good for the industry, but it's also good for, for me as a professional to uh, <laughs> so have someone to bounce ideas off. Selfish of you, I but know. I understand. The, uh, the other thing too, is you and I get these emails weekly and we are part of 
strengthcoach.com now with coach Boyle. And we see these questions and we discuss these things weekly as well. Uh, so we've, we've got some great content, some great ideas already going and some great discussions already happening. But as you said, the, this is now uh, a long, long form discussion that we can have and provide more context. As you're saying, the Twitter, Instagram, Insta, Insta chat and snap face, uh, as Bill <laughs> Belichick would say, don't provide enough context. And I think that's where a lot of the arguments end up happening or a lot of the disagreements. Uh, I think a lot of us would agree more or learn a lot more if we got the context from the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And um, these are also the kind of conversations you have with your clients every day. Again, if you're someone who actually coaches, and you're not just like an Instagram strength and strength and conditioning coach or Twitter physical therapist, um, and you actually see people every day. These are also the types of conversations you want to be able to have with your clients when they ask questions, because right. they want to ask like, um, "Hey, are carbs bad for me?" or um, "Should I do CrossFit?" or whatever their their question is that they ask you on a daily basis. Um, you know, I think it's important to be able to have longer form discussions about that rather than these kind of like. Uh, very generalized, polarizing tweets or statements or things like that. This just allows for a better form for for understanding for um, both our clients and other fitness professionals. Yeah, we we did discuss that beforehand as we want this to also be <clears throat> relevant to the people that we work with and the average fitness consumer, not, uh, not just trainers, not just physical therapists or rehab professionals. We want this to be an all-encompassing discussion, which again, comes down to putting on those different hats. So my answer to my client might be a little bit different than my answer to a trainer or to a rehab professional or to a researcher. Um, and I want us to both provide all of those answers and perspectives. And then eventually we'll bring other people on to, to do the same and give their perspective. Yeah. And so we hope to do this like once a week. Um, so we'll record on the weekends, we'll probably get it out by the end of the following week. Uh, I guess we'll have to figure out what our actual day is. It'd be good if we drop it on the same day every week, but yeah. we can figure that out. Um, whenever day you're listening to this on. And, um, you know, if we're going to plan to open this up for people to send in questions as well, um, because like Brendan said, we can pull a lot of content from places like strengthcoach.com or our CFSC group or like discussions with our clients or coworkers. Um, but if you're someone who listens, um, we'd like to have you be a part of the conversation and contribute. So uh, we're going to definitely open up a forum or some avenue for you to ask questions um, of us here as well. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's get rolling. Let's go with the first, the first. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I mean, this goes back to Mike uh, continuing to make waves as a 60 year old millennial on uh, social media, <laughs> uh, as he says. Um, I mean, no one has, uh, not many people have leveraged things like Twitter, I think much better than, than Michael Boyle, yeah. but, um, he, he's great for a one line snippet too. Yeah. Um, and I think he kind of thrives on the, um, internet interactions, which is not something that I, um, am very excited about always doing, but he seems to really thrive in that environment. So, I don't know, he tweeted, he's been on these programming one oh one tweets as of late that have been really, really good. Um, just kind of giving basic common sense approaches to uh to programming for coaches like real practical coaches like you whether it be exercise selection or um injury risk things like that and so this last tweet that seems to be gotten a lot of play was his question about orthopedic cost um and how especially as we get older we want to think about selecting exercises that um, are going to be more tolerable because as we age um you're uh, ability to adapt to stressors reduces. Um, and I retweeted it, his tweet this morning that got a lot of like, uh, kind of negative feedback from some people and asked the question, like, is it really controversial to say that as we get older, we might become less adaptable or tolerable to certain loads, um, volumes of exercise, or even certain movements? Um, that shouldn't be a controversial statement to me, but I think a lot of people uh, read Mike's tweet and thought, that the, some of the responses were kind of mind blowing to me. And then they were like, Oh, you're telling people not to exercise. And I'm like, you know, this guy owns a gym, right? Uh, I don't think that's in his best interest. I think what he was asking was, um, you know, could we have a more intelligent 
approach to exercise um, or have exercise age with us, right? Because how you right. train when you're 20 is probably not how you're, you're training now at, uh, at 33. Right. And your goals have changed. But so the, the thing that I'm envisioning, <clears throat> if I'm the Twitter consumer that doesn't know Mike and doesn't know his system or doesn't know his philosophy, and again, these are tweets, so he can only provide so much context in that little snippet is they're viewing him as a, as a fear monger, right? That like, Oh no, like <clears throat> you're getting old. You should be afraid to exercise. You should be, you should be afraid to move. And as you mentioned, that, that is clearly not the truth. He has mm -hmm. hundreds of people exercising at, at his gym every single day uh, from the ages of 11 to 85. Um, so the idea of orthopedic cost, <clears throat> I like the, term the cost of doing business uh charlie which is Weingroff. charlie weingroff had had coined or is that that was the first time i had heard that so for every decision we make not just exercise every decision we make in our lives there's a cost of doing business so in order for me to do x i have to give up y um and sometimes it's worth giving up Y to get X. And sometimes you find out it's not. <laughs> That's called risk. Uh, I did like one of the responses on Twitter was the goal is to end the tank on empty um, at the end. So if there is theoretically this uh, set point, right? They call it the set point theory that your heartbeat has only so many heartbeats in its life. And if you use them all up when you're 20, uh, you're going to die at 40. Uh, if you, your elbow can only <laughs> bend so many times, right? And if I bend it over 1 million times, it's going to break on 1 million and one, which is, there's, I feel like there's a little bit of truth, but also uh, a little bit of falseness there as well. Like if, so if you move well, you can move this joint as much as you want over a very, very long period of time. And something else is going to give out way before your joints do. Now, if you move poorly and your elbow positioning is either <clears throat> you did something to your shoulder and now your elbow has to make up for that. Eventually, yeah, that, now your elbow needs to take up the slack for a bad shoulder. So then you could say that eventually over time due to that poor movement, that elbow is going to give out. Now you could then look at what do people do on their, on a daily basis? Do they throw a baseball every single day? Uh, I can tell you over time, eventually there's going to be a risk of doing a cost of doing business or an orthopedic cost to throwing a baseball for many, many, many years. Um, there's going to be adaptations to the, the arm and shoulder, the elbow, um, and that's, that carries risk with it. That carries an orthopedic cost, as Mike said. So how do we prolong that orthopedic uh, cost as long as possible so that at the end of your life, you're on empty? Um, well, it's you funny you brought up a, couple, a funny thing, like in, in you said like the heartbeat preservation theory, which is a joke John Palaf always makes. Yes, uh, to that's me, where I got it from. Ask him if he's, working out. he's like, I don't want to use up too many. Um, but it's actually, when you look at, um, highly competitive athletes, they actually die, uh, much earlier than like the average person, um, on, on average. So, um, it, that's not just general fit people, but that's people like the highly competitive athletes. So there's something to that, right. A high amount of, uh, stress over time. I mean, training is stress, just like anything is stress. Um, right. and if you have high unrelenting stress, like competitive athletics for a long period of your life, um, it's reasons to believe that might uh, reduce your life expectancy or your life quality at the end. And you make some sacrifices there. That's what right. I always talk to. Uh, one of my clients played um, college football at a very high level and his knees are all jacked up. And he always talks about, it. I said, you partially when you play a competitive sport or do something at a high level or high volume or high intensity for a long part of time, you mortgage part of your future, right? Whether it's from an orthopedic mm -hmm. standpoint or a cardiovascular standpoint or whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, th there is a little bit of, a little bit of truth to that. And I think, um, with that said, we still can adapt to stressors as we age, right? You see plenty of old people, so to speak, like we have people in their seventies or eighties who are working out who are still getting stronger 
now they don't get stronger as quickly. Uh, it takes longer for them to recover. Um, our exercise selection is definitely more conservative. Um, one, because there's greater risk uh, for injury at that age, what it could do to you. Um, and they might have years of usage of their joints or uh, adaptations to postures or activities that make certain exercises harder to do. And that I feel like isn't that controversial of a thing to say. Um, if you, you and I have a longer discussion to parse this out. Um, and like you said, I think a lot of people go the idea like you're fear mongering. Well, I mean, if, if I said to the person, you know, yeah, don't do that exercise, you're going to die. Or don't do that exercise, you're going to break your back. Probably yeah. not great bedside <laughs> manner or communication skills, right? But um, any coach uh, who's actually coached for a longer period of time can probably find a way to deliver the message that, you know, some activities might be um, less tolerable uh, as people age and grow um, without making someone afraid of doing things, right? Just providing a better understanding. And so that goes to communication skills um, right. as much as exercise selection. Well, as you mentioned, the guy, your client who played football with the bad knees, it's it's not me fear mongering. It's me having a legitimate discussion and saying, hey, you you gave up your knee health to play highly competitive football. Um, and that was a risk and a problem you were willing to deal with later on in your life. Maybe you didn't think about it at the time and maybe you regret it a bit now, but that doesn't mean we can go back and, and change that. So we need to move forward with a plan that will maintain and keep everything that you have, but will not jeopardize or hurt your knees even more, right? So I don't see that as fear mongering. I see that as making the best exercise selection possible, which is what Mike is discussing, discussing here is he says, <clears throat> each exercise has an orthopedic cost to it. So if he already has an orthopedic problem, and as a coach who's coached many, many people and still does, almost everybody comes in with some sort of orthopedic problem. And therefore, since they've already spent a lot of their orthopedic money on certain joints <laughs> or certain, certain things, I don't want to spend any more of that currency. I want to keep as much of the currency as I can. So therefore, the, the person, the athlete or the gentleman with the bad knees, we're probably not going to squat. And it's not because I'm trying to scare him into not squatting. It's because we're using that information to make the best decision possible moving forward. So therefore he can prolong his need for a knee replacement, or maybe he doesn't ever need to get knee replacements, but I'm going to go for more um, hip dominant type exercises and keep asking him the, does it hurt question? If this hurts your knees, there's plenty of other things we can do. Uh, and, and we're going to choose to do those instead. Um, but I'm not going to, tell him to start squatting in order to not to avoid fear mongering or yeah. to avoid hurting his feelings or scaring him out of exercise. Yeah. Um, and it's almost, I like when you say you keep going back to the idea of cost. Cause if you talk in an analogy of like economics and, and finance, it can make sense. And so it's almost like younger people with less injury history have a higher credit limit. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And as you get older, your credit limit, your uh, ability to play or spend um, without having to have savings in the bank uh, is is high is is higher, and as you get older, it starts to get lower, right? So it's almost like you're 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 saying like there's almost so much buffer zone where we can work. And so again, you go back to like the, the exact client that I'm referring to, like he says to me like oh, I really want to sprint and jump um, and do a bunch of like higher impact stuff. And mind you, this is a guy who's had uh, almost double digit knee surgeries now between the two knees and it's in line for a replacement. He's in his mid fifties. And um, we still train really hard. We just don't really run and jump because I know reliably he's going to come in in the next day and be miserable. Um, and that's not what we're in the business of doing. That doesn't take away from his potential for improving health. Like a lot of people were like, well, the benefits of exercise are so high. 
why would you encourage people not to do things? I'm happy if they do anything. I'm like, well, this guy trains four days a week um, <laughs> and lifts really heavy. He just can't run and hop and jump uh, like a lot or it's going to bother, bother him. But we do split squats. We do deadlifts. We do push-ups. We do bench press. We do a normal strength training program. So I think, um, again, giving some context to the conversation, we have a lot of um, older adults um, who have an injury history, who train really hard. They just might not do some exercises uh, because it's problematic. Right. And now if we go to the youth athlete, right? So if we can mitigate risk and orthopedic cost at a young age, right? So basically we're saying is don't train like you and I did or like Mike did <laughs> when we were younger. Uh, we can prolong that that cur that like you said that credit limit or keep the credit limit higher for the rest of your life so if i don't do a bunch of dumb stuff when i'm young that could potentially get me injured like you and i have both hurt our backs multiple times doing power lifting meets and power lifting for probably i power lifted for probably eight straight years and did a lot of damage to my joints and my shoulder mobility and my back, there was a cost to doing that. And I loved it. Right. But if, if I can impart that knowledge on somebody who is younger than me and say, Hey, now that I'm older, I realize if I was in your position again, I would have done it differently. And this is what I would have done. We can help the youth population to, I mean, the whole goal is to not fall into the same traps yeah. <laughs> that, you and I did that Mike did and that we're seeing in these older athletes uh, that their training might have not have been the best training in the world. And the whole point uh, of training back in the 70s, 80s and 90s was to just basically destroy yourself uh, and try to adapt to that. That was what training was. Uh, and now we have a much better idea of things that will cost you mm -hmm. that that money which is why at mbsc we don't back squat because the orthopedic costs of back squatting are not worth the risks for most athletes and i say most because there are some athletes that do back squat there i have some athletes with the football team i'm working with that i do allow to back squat because they can they've they've earned it uh but there's a lot of them that I don't because I know the orthopedic cost is not worth the risk. So it's not worth missing football games. It's not worth the knee and back pain that they, they might, I can't confirm that they will, but they might get when they're older. If I decide to try to break <laughs> or uh, really, really challenge these athletes to a degree that, we see who survives and who doesn't, right? Who sinks and who swims. That's not a good um, benchmarker for me uh, to keep our athletes healthy, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with some of these programs. Uh, I will not use names, uh, but you go into this, this system or this gym or this program and they just see who survives and whoever makes it gets ripped and jacked, right? Like we know- mm -hmm that if you can survive these workouts with the weights that they prescribe and the amount of cardio and sprinting, and if you can survive it, you will get ripped and jacked. And then we champion those people on social media and say, if you do it, you could look like this too. The, it's what always we the don't exception see, to the rule, right? Right, the exception it's to like the rule. It's like the video of the old lady deadlifting like 400 pounds. Right. And everyone's like, this is why you should lift. I'm like, okay, <clears throat> Uh, go get a bunch of 80 year olds and, and have them deadlift a uh, straight bar and load as heavy as you can see how they recover. <laughs> right. We only see the one in 1000 that survived. We don't see the 999 that failed survivorship or got injured, bias, right? It's survivorship, survivorship bias. Yes. So we only see the survivors, which is really, really troublesome to me because then when we see the survivors, the media, the media tells us that that's what we should look like and that's what we should strive for. And therefore we should do what program they're doing. Right. And that for 99, 999 people out of 1000, that's not going to be beneficial for them because of the orthopedic cost of doing so.
right? If, yeah. if you do a exercise program or a workout that leaves you injured, that was not a good workout. <laughs> if it yeah. leaves you puking and throwing up and so sore that you can't work out the next day, you should be able to work out the next day. If you can't work out or walk or go to the bathroom, that was not a good workout in my opinion. Um, because the goal is to be leave the tank on empty at the end. You don't want your tank on empty when you're 22 years old or 30 years old, right? Because you still got to use what's left in that tank for the next 40 years. Yeah. And so going back to your idea of like um, cost and going back to the idea of like a credit card or, or having a credit limit, like younger, fitter people can pay back their debt for training much easier, right? Because you're essentially creating a debt, you're stressing them, and then you have to recovery is you paying back that debt, sleeping, eating, all those things that go into to recovering from training. And so realize that if someone doesn't move particularly well, not very efficient, there's a higher cost to doing a movement, right? If their joint is really stiff, um, or they're not efficiently moving the load, because they can't keep their chest up in a squat, um, or something like that, there's a higher orthopedic cost, because that metabolically is harder for them to do. It's more stressful for that individual. Um, and so when it comes into exercise selection for anybody of any age, younger people, older people, we're going to choose exercises that we think we get the highest value from at the lowest cost, because it's going to allow us to do it more frequently for longer periods and recover better between bouts of exercise. Um, and so whenever, when you go use the back squat example, looking at I know Mike looking at the BU players, the kind of the times that he started talking about moving towards single leg work and me just looking at the kids that come into the gym. Um, they all have a really low training age. And more, the majority of people that come to every training facility of any age are, generally have a low training age. They don't have a lot of good experience strength training. Um, so you have to choose exercises that have a low cost because they don't have the ability to pay back the training debt if they don't move well or they, they, um, uh, aren't particularly fit, right? So that's why the exercise selections we make are the ones that they are. And as you even touched on, like some of your more advanced football guys, they earned the right, they got their credit limit raised, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll yep. stay there for a while until uh, they aren't able to do that. Um, because you make training choices for cost benefit analysis, right? Like it probably benefits those guys to lift really heavy and squat, uh, just like some of our athletes, like all of our competitive athletes, we deadlift, trap our deadlift, load them up every week. As we get older with adults, we don't really do that as much. We choose single leg deadlifting or single leg squats, just like our, all of our athletes, Olympic lift, right? Big, heavy bilateral, uh, barbell lift at Mike Boyles, who, the, who would have thought? Um, but at, over time, when athletes get older, maybe they have history of wrist injuries. A lot of our hockey guys, um, they start swinging kettlebells and jumping and, and doing things like that because there's less cost involved. And so it's always that um, cost benefit analysis you're going to make when it comes to exercise selection and someone's age um, and injury history is going to directly impact that. Yeah. And goals too. So goals mm -hmm. is another one. Like, right. If my goal is to play competitive football where I need to make tackles and I'm going to get hit or, or I'm playing hockey and I'm skating at 20 miles per hour and I'm going to hit the boards or if somebody could jack me up from the side, I need a different level of strength. I need a different level of power. I need a different level of conditioning than somebody who just wants to feel good, look good, play with the kids, go get the mail and be able to play a pickup basketball game, right? Those are different so now we're looking now, now the word is fitness, right? So what's fitness is really just your ability to do a task, right? So if I'm 80 years old, most of my tasks are not, uh, contact type sports, uh, or it's, it's to get up, get dressed, go for a walk, uh, enjoy the things that I like to enjoy, right? So that that's going to require different exercise selection as you as you touched on right we're not going to olympic lift with them they don't need that type of speed or power or that type of uh, uh stressor in their life at this point because their credit limit has changed but also the amount of credit that they need in order to live the life they want to live has also changed as well um, so goals have to be a factor here too um, not just 
the orthopedic costs. Like if, if, and you've touched, you mentioned a minimal effective dose, right? So if my goal is to just feel good and look good, do I need to back squat, double my body weight to feel good and look good? But the answer is no, um, or probably not. Uh, I could probably get everything that I need by doing split squats, single leg squats, goblet squats, uh, things that have less orthopedic cost uh, and allow me to train more often, which is going to lead me closer to my goal, which is to be healthy and, and fit for whatever it is I need to do. I don't need to back squat or, or deadlift double my body weight anymore if my goals my goals have changed from uh, serious athletics, which my goal for my football players are those two things. Uh, But after they graduate and they're just working, they have a career, they have kids, uh, they want to feel good and they got to work eight to 10 hours a day. uh, That those two things are not my standard anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, look at this sign behind me, right? Yeah. If we truly believe the idea of what movement as medicine or movement is medicine and um, realize that when you think about medicine or you take, think about any medical treatment, there's always upsides and there's always going to be potential risks, right? You ever hear a pharmaceutical commercial, right? After they tell you why, what all the th- good things it's going to do for you, they tell you the potential risk factors because those things have actually happened, right? They have to disclose those. Any medical treatment has risks, but when people undergo a medical treatment or take a pill or take medicine, they do it because they thought about that asymmetrical risk in their head. And well, I'm going to get an X amount of benefit from doing this um, versus the, uh, the risk that I could have by taking this treatment or this medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same thing with exercise, right? Um, it, you're going to make choices based on those person's goals. If it, that exercise suits that person's goals, then the, the risk is uh, ne- negative enough or the benefit is positive enough that you're going to make that choice. And so sometimes you have these purists that respond to like Mike's tweet or something. And they're like, oh, well, I would just encourage people to do anything because exercise is good. Yes. In a general sense, we want everyone to exercise. With that said, I think we would be completely naive to not address that there is certain risks to doing it. Um, and some people want to minimize those risks. Um, and then if someone is trying to compete at the highest level or get to some sort of fitness goal, maybe um, they're not worried about those risks because the ratio is in their favor. And so you, you want to always remember that, that to say that like there isn't a risk um, is just naive. Right. And, and uh, uh, nutrition might be a good example, right? We want everyone to eat. Everyone needs to eat, right? We want everyone to exercise. Everyone needs physical activity. But if I have the choice between a donut and an apple, right? We all know which one is better. We all know the apple is better for you than the donut, right? But if I always grab the donut, that's going to cause a different problem over a long period of time. So it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. So if I, it's everything in moderation, right? Including moderation. So if I don't exercise, the risks or the symptoms that I get from not exercising, right? Weight, weight gain, diabetes, uh, joint pain. Uh, I, I can't do the things I want to do in my life, right? Right. What, what do you hate more? <laughs> yeah. Exercising 30 minutes a day, seven days a week, or having uh, uh, diabetes and being stuck on your couch and living in pain all day long, right? Like, and so ne- neither is guaranteed, right? So I can't guarantee that if you don't exercise, those things are going to happen to you. But based off of the trends we've seen over a very long period of time, people who are physically inactive end up going down that route. But there's also this other route that if you take it to the nth extreme, right, where you're exercising two hours a day and going hard for 40 straight years, that has a a cost to it as well. So that's equally, can be equally as detrimental as not exercising. So, right, there's this happy medium that this moderation that we need to stay in between based off of your goals and what your credit limit is, because you don't want to overspend what your credit limit is, and you don't want to do nothing so that you have no credit at all. 
Mm -hmm. right? So that you want to be somewhere in between because the point of having credit is to be able to use it, right? So that, exactly. uh, right? So I have good credit so that I can buy a house, that I can buy a new car, that I can, I can expense that at some point. And you never know when it's going to be. Um, yeah, and and, I, think, I, I think what's funny too that you made me think of during that is that one thing we miss is that all these conversations that are being had, they're all being had by fitness professionals and people who like to work out and yeah. people who like are into lifting, right? Which gives a slanted perspective on, you know, wanting to lift really heavy and like wanting to do really aggressive exercise. I could think of the majority of the people that, that are in the adult group that come and train at Mike Bullshit and conditioning don't really give a shit about what exercise we do. Um, in fact, there's probably, they don't really want to load shit really heavier. They don't want to really crush themselves like a lot of these fitness people do. So when you start to criticize um, some of these approaches that you see on the internet done by people who are fitness enthusiasts and they say, oh no, like everyone should lift heavy or everyone should squat or everyone should barbell deadlift, realize that that's not being said by someone who is a normal exercise consumer. Um, and right. so like, if I think about your average general population client, they just want to feel better. You go back to goals. Like you said, um, they want to feel better. They probably want to look a little better with their shirt off. Um, they'd like to not feel stiff and in pain, uh, when they get up in the morning, like that, that's not, a t it's a pretty low hanging fruit, but they're not also trying to be a CrossFit athlete or a power lifter or a competitive athlete really at all. Um, and so go back to what the average person wants. And lots of times we get lost in these conversations between a bunch of fitness professionals and you start to get a little bit out of touch with what the average person who actually pays our bills uh, wants. And that's why it's important if you're going to have these discussions that you actually coach people uh, and actually work with real people in real life. <laughs> yeah, the, the average person who, who can afford personal training and can afford group training uh, has expensed their health in order to be able to make enough money to then have to buy their health back. Yeah. That's, that's usually what happens is they've, and I think it's a Dalai Lama quote that uh, people expense their health when they're young and then have to buy their health back later. I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, that's, that's who we're seeing. We're not seeing people. I don't have a group of professional power lifters or because they of, wouldn't need you as a coach. They don't need me. They train, <laughs> they train themselves six days a week. Right. And of course there's, there's, there are coaches who do that only specifically. But again, if I'm looking at most of the people that do this for a career, they do it with the average person or the average athlete. They don't do it training only power lifters, only Olympic lifters, only professional, whatever. Right there. So uh, we need to be able to apply our systems and our philosophy and thought process over a very wide general population, both young and old, and not how you like to train. That's it. it I like to do certain things. I also have a, 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 what I've been lifting for 18 years now. So training age is, is huge. I, I can't think of anybody who's walked into any of the places I've worked over the last 10 years who had a training age of five years or more. <laughs> um, most people have a training age of one or zero, or they trained when they were in their twenties and haven't trained in the last 35 years. Um, yeah. So that is going to dictate our exercise selection, which is all dictated by orthopedic cost and what their goals are currently in their life. Not what my goals are, or what my goals are for them, what their goals are, and what type of uh, who I'm working with, like where we need to meet them where they're at, right? So the the person with the bad knees, we we've got to adjust for that orthopedic problem and make sure we don't spend any more of that money. Yeah, and kind of it's actually kind of a good segue to um, one of the other Next things one. We, we briefly touched on, but about like perspective on social media and how we communicate on social media. Like it's obviously yeah. become very popular in our industry um, to be inflammatory, um, to call people out, to, you know, like do things to try to incite engagement. Um, and, and I think that it's fitness professionals playing to other fitness professionals, right? As opposed to finding ways to communicate best and help clients and help the average person who's the consumer. Again, I think sometimes we get in this 
uh, fitness industry thing where everyone, we all just talk in circles and the client's not really a part of it. Um, when in reality, we should be trying to serve those people. And so people, a lot of fitness professionals take an inflammatory approach to try to stir the pot on social media because I think it drives engagement. They see like I got more likes or more follows or more shares. Um, and engagement is one metric that we're all like programmed to now through social media because they want us to be like addicted to that. Um, but that doesn't really serve the client. It's not a great way to educate um, the average consumer um, who is going to be paying your bills, uh, so to speak. So um, rather than providing value, I think a lot of fitness professionals move towards just trying to get engagement from other people within the, within the industry. I can tell you right now, not a single person has walked into this, this cross gym because of anything I've written on <laughs> social media or Twitter or a discussion I've had with another fitness professional. People come in here from recommendations from people who are already in here. Yelp, Yelp reviews and Yelp. Uh, they find me on Yelp and Google Maps or Google Business. That's it. Those are the three places that people find me because the people who are going to come work with you uh, usually live within a 10 mile radius of wherever your gym is, right? Th those are the people who pay my bills. So those are the people I need to spend a majority of my time caring about and worrying about and <clears throat> my energies on. Uh, now I would be lying if I said I didn't get into some of my own, uh, sp uh, spitting matches on the internet, uh, it sometimes it, it really gets you and you you get into it, but I do my best to control uh, who I let take my time. Um, and this is where you, us being on strengthcoach.com is very helpful because there's a barrier for entry there. And the generally the conversations we have there are very respectful and they're all inquisitive. Uh, and this is the problem I see most on on social media is it's not it's not inquisitive questioning thought uh, or discussion it's here are my views take them or leave them and then when the other individual shares their views and nobody asks any questions not a single question is asked <laughs> it's just this is my opinion this is my view take it or leave it but nothing gets no change no minds are changed nobody learns Wait, it's just when someone if someone makes fun of you on a meme it doesn't convince you to change your way of thinking uh, no, if anything, it grounds you, right? It grounds you deeper into that belief or thought. Uh, and then that person says, well, screw you. I'm going to prove you even more or prove myself even more right, right? And so therefore, nobody, nobody has learned from that discussion. No, again, no, but no minds have been changed. Nobody's even given a thought to something else. So that's where I think we need to be more inquisitive of like, why do you think like that? Like why not, oh my God, I can't believe you're telling people not to exercise. Orthopedic costs, I can't believe you just said don't exercise. Then, no, no, no. You, you ask a question, you say, are you saying that people shouldn't exercise? Question mark, right? And you allow that person to then respond because now we have more context. Again, this is where a lot of these conversations get lost or they get dropped is that in 240 characters, is it 240 now or 140 on Twitter? It's two, 240. 240. 240 characters. You cannot provide enough context. The only way you can provide context is to reply to questions. But then the problem then becomes if people don't read all of the comments or all the replies, I can't tell you the number of times you and I have written an article and people comment on it and be like, those are the worst looking push-ups I've ever seen in my life. I remember this article you wrote yeah. on push-up progression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone wrote, that's the worst push-up I've ever seen in my life because of the picture. And you wrote back, like, uh, you do know that that picture was showing you how not to do push-ups. <laughs> did, did you read the article? Question oh, mark. And, the, they and never the, read it. the guy said, no, I didn't read the article. I just looked at the picture and the title, right? So mm -hmm. that's, again, that, but also as the writer, or as the producer of that content, we have to be more conscious of like what, what the title is and what the picture is because we need to realize that people uh, unfortunately are going to just look at snippets. And again, this is why Twitter has is lasted as long as it has. People just look at the snippets and then they confirm their own biases or it, it 
elicits or uh, it brings up some sort of rage or some sort of uh, opinion that they feel like they have to share and nobody has a discussion. These, this is why I've almost completely backed away from both Instagram and Twitter. And I just repost things or share mm-hmm. things from other sites uh, and don't respond to comments be, yeah. unless, unless it's a question. Good. If it's a question, I will respond to it. But if you're just going to share your opinion uh, and we're not going to have a discussion, I'm not going to waste my time. Well, I like how you said, I, yeah, go and waste, waste your time is exactly it. Like, I like how you said you were careful of what you give you energy to or who you give your energy to. Um, because I think sometimes coaches, especially young ones, get wrapped up in social media discussions, social media disputes, um, and spend just a lot of time on social media. I'm not saying it's bad. We, I use it a ton. Um, yep. for my business, my real in-person business. Uh, and like, whether it's CFSC or movement is medicine, but I think sometimes it's easy to get caught in a road to nowhere because um, I, one of my favorite books, I know you've read it was perennial seller by Ryan holiday. And he talks about brands or businesses or people that are like timeless, right? They have created value forever. Um, and that's why they're perennial sellers. That's why like certain books continue to sell for years and years and years because they're a value add. Um, A lot of the interactions and a lot of the media produced on social media isn't a value add, right? Like you never think like, oh man, remember that great fitness meme from like three years ago that that guy made? Like no one's ever had that conversation, but you might think like, hey, remember that great article I read all about energy systems or this great article I read all about cueing and coaching and you continue to reference back to it because there's value there that continues a lot of the interactions on social media are a waste of your time and energy for one, but they aren't interactions or work that produces lasting value. Hence the reason we want to kind of have this podcast is because this is something that people can continue to listen to and hopefully get value from for years. Um, If you spend a lot of time in the Instagram comment section or on Twitter replies, arguing with people um, one, that's not valuable comment. Uh, It's cheap content that, uh, isn't going to stand the test of time and it's not producing any value for you or really many other people. Um, there are some uses of Twitter and things that can be really valuable. Um, like I see some people doing really going all in on um, like uh, Twitter chains or Twitter threads, right. Um, with like a lot of like really thoughtful content, but it's not um, replying snarky to other individuals. It's not them making fun of people or signaling to their tribe. It's them saying, here's this valuable story or this valuable lesson that I'm going to give you in a 20 tweet Twitter thread. And those are things that you save. But the, um, the typical uh, backbiting and, and memeing and things in the fitness industry aren't really useful. And I wouldn't also say that they're uh, wise choices for career development either um, because there's no staying power there. The, uh... I think it was Felix who asked me when I was, I was doing a podcast or a, a lecture for uh, the CFSC coaches in Brazil. And he said, I mean, I, I'll use his words. What, what is the one thing you've done to make yourself so successful or your career successful? Now, success, we can argue what that is. Uh, am I successful? I don't know. But <clears throat> The number one thing I think I do personally is I play the long game always. I never play the short game. And that's all I'm hearing you say is when I write an article or we have a long format discussion like so, and we post this on YouTube and it can be viewed later on, or I can reference an article. We do it all the time on strengthcoach.com. We say, hey, where was that article that came out? I mean, it was 10 years ago, but we're still reading it because it was that good 10 years ago. I don't do that with tweets and Instagram posts and, and it's a long-term play. And I always say, I'm going to be here talking about fitness, uh, uh, coaching, sharing what I've learned for the next 40 years. Right. And you and I are going to be old. We're going to, Oh, we're going to be old curmudgeons and we're going to be doing the same senile. We're going to be just old grumpy men doing this still and most of the people that you're seeing or following or watching won't be here five years from now because they're playing the short game right memes memes comments discussions opinions 
or sorry, opinions, comments, uh, memes, th those are all short term gains, right? You, you are in somebody's mind or somebody's ear for 20 seconds, right? Um, but helping a large group of people who want to get better, feel better, right? The, the value add, right? Helping my clients is going to keep me around way longer than making a meme or way longer than having an argument on, on Twitter or Instagram. Um, and as you said, now, now there are examples of, of you learning something or questioning somebody or getting an idea um, or learning something new. Yes, it, it does happen, but not to the same long-term degree that we're looking for. Um, and I'm going to spend most of my energy helping people who want to do this long-term. I don't, I don't give my energy to people who are going to be in and out or just like to exercise, or they look good in, in their spandex with their shirt off. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. Like we, the, there's uh, opportunity there for a certain group of people or influencers, whatever we want to call them. That's fine. I, I'm, I'm going to play the long game. I'm going to be here a long time and I'm going to help the people who want to be here a long time because I only have so much energy to, energy to give you. You and I had this discussion once, I believe it was Todd, Todd Bumgarner. And he said, how do we help the people there? There, Cause I think it's like something like 18% of people exercise or 18% of people go to gyms or, or something like that. I can't remember what the number is. It's under 20%. Mm -hmm. And how do we help the other 80% of people who aren't physically active, who aren't going to the gym? And I said, I can barely help the 18, 20%, right? That are going, <laughs> right? I'm going to spend my energy there helping the people who want help. I, I love the quote, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Now, uh, I think it was Martin Rooney who said, you can make the horse very, very thirsty, right? So <laughs> part of my job, and your job is to motivate people to, to make them want to drink the water, but I can't force the water down your throat. Um, and that's what I'm thinking here is I'm playing the long game and I don't want to fall into that, that bucket where I'm, I'm putting all of my energy into short term items or people. Um, and because, and because again, I feel like I will be irrelevant in five years from now if I do that. So I'm just not, I'm not going to spend my energy there. Uh, that is a perfect way to, uh, kind of wrap up that topic. And, um, also props to your wife, cause she, Jenny Rierig had a great presentation about like this exact topic at the winter seminar last year. I don't actually remember what the name is, but if you go to the winter seminar recording from 2021, it's on um, MBSC TV and uh, CFSC. Um, and she talks directly about that, uh, creating value um, as opposed to just engagement in how to go about um, communicating through social media as a medium for a, a career development standpoint. So definitely check that out if uh, you enjoyed that part of the discussion because Jenny did a really good job, probably sound a lot smarter than Brendan and I. And awesome. <laughs> definitely. Um, but one thing I thought about doing as a segment, uh, as we kind of get to the end of every episode here is to you and I, one of the most popular questions we get is, Hey, what book, what book should we read? Um, and I'm looking at a giant pile of books. Uh, and this is just the downstairs collection. The upstairs collection is upstairs. Um, but, uh, the, in front of me, and there's plenty of books we could recommend. So I figure if we could give a book recommendation every week, yeah. Uh, what we like about it, given name, because I think a lot of people could take something away from, from this. So um, do you have a, a book to recommend? So there's, there's two. Uh, and I listened to these books. I didn't buy them. I, I have a feeling, though, they would be just equally as good in paper. But Martin Rooney's last two books, and I've read his other books before, they're more uh, about training and the exercises and, and high 10 and coach to coach are written in a story form as if you are the coach in the story. And there, the lessons in there, now a shameless plug, the book I wrote, Coaching Rules, is the same thing just written in rule form in bullet points, like a blog post. He wrote it in story form. 
Um, and I loved, I loved both books. The stories are incredible. You can totally insert yourself as the coach in both stories. Uh, and they're motivational. They're easy to listen to. And they're just really good, good listens if you're going for a walk or you're working out in the gym. Um, so yeah, those, those would be my two recommendations. Coach to Coach or High 10 by Martin Rooney. I'll tell you, Martin's high 10 presentation he did at Perform Better um, this past December uh, that they had in Providence was the best presentation I've ever heard him give. And that says a lot. I mean, he does a lot of public speaking. I've seen him speak yeah. a bunch, but maybe because it spoke to me most directly, like you said, a lot of much of his past material was exercise focused. This was leadership, yeah. management, career development focused. And maybe mm -hmm. it spoke to me as to where like we are in our career. Um, I left it and I thought like, wow, that was really good. Like I gave me a lot of things to think about that I'm still thinking about. So I actually haven't read high 10 yet, but I will, um, I know you had recommended it. So I'll add that to my list um, as well. And what do so, you got? um, so I, I was thinking about, you know, books that I reference back to that I find really valuable that, um, maybe some people haven't read. Um, and the one that I recommend all the time, I know you've heard me is smart moves, uh, by Carla Hannaford. I actually just re read a bunch of sections from it again the other day um just thinking about one my winter seminar presentation um and just thinking about some different things we do in, we've been doing at the gym and smart moves is by dr carla hannaford she is a um she works with children um who typically have motor development or emotional um uh psychological issues as when they're younger and so she uses movement as a tool for intervention to help people improve their development their physical development their mental development um, at the age. And we know that exercise is a direct um, path to the brain as far as uh, cognitive development goes and uh, maintenance of cognitive abilities as we get older. Um, we know that the brain and body aren't separated anymore. And she really touches on the practical application of that and what um, the outcomes are and, and actually talks about some practical drills. And so if you're a trainer, although this book is really made for like educators, um, you're going to see a whole bunch of parallels to working with kids as well as working with adults um, in why um, some things outside of the weight room are important. Um, things like skipping, th things like shuffling, things like crawling um, from a cognitive development standpoint again. Um, and so I would really recommend that book if you're a trainer or you're just someone who is kind of interested about how exercise and movement affects your brain health. Um, I would highly recommend uh, picking that up. It's a great parenting book too. I found. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love her stuff on movement breaks. I think it was her that, that has movement breaks in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the examples you're talking about the movement break examples every, I think it's every 30 or 45 minutes. Cause I think I mean, she's a teacher, correct? With young kids. Yep. And she talks about the movement breaks that they have in school and then backs it up with science, which is even better. Yeah. And I mean, you think about like when I was a kid, like I had to move around, right? I couldn't sit at a desk all day. Why do you think we do this for a living? Um, I couldn't sit. I mean, I've been sitting here for an hour and, and <laughs> I'm already antsy. Um, so, you know, how our kids need to move. They can't, they're not made to be stuffed into a chair for six straight hours. And um, how you can incorporate exercise into learning is, is really interesting. So um, as we wrap up here, you got anything coming up this week? What's on the horizon at uh, Train Smarter and Harder? Uh, here, no, I, I mean, just clients. And then we're in the midst of our off season football training program. So right now we have 40 kids voluntarily showing up Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays for 90 minute workouts. Um, and so I've been spending a lot of my time there and then I've got the stuff going on here in the gym, just my normal clients, uh, my next teaching is going to be February 27th, I believe, or 24th in Los Altos, which is close to San Jose. I might have the date wrong there. I but think it's, it's the 27th, right? The 27th. That's the end of February, the last Sunday in February. So if anyone's interested in, in coming to that, that's where I will be teaching next. Uh, and then that's, yeah, that's what I got going on this week. How about you? Another Winter seminar uh, coming up. Yep. And even before that, we have a CFSC uh, one week from today at Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning in Woburn, Massachusetts, the, uh, the mothership. Come so uh, we'll be back at MBSC a week from today for a level one course that I'll be teaching along with uh, a couple of my 
lovely co-teachers. I think I have Ben Connolly, possibly Steve Bigelow with me as well. Um, still time to sign up for that. If uh, You're probably going to be hearing this the day before. So if you hear it, you sign up. Uh, it's going to be really last minute. But um, that's where I'll be. And then, yeah, winter seminar is going to be February 26th and 27th um, at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning as well. Um, you still got plenty of time to sign up for that. Um, we got some great speakers. We have Les Spellman, um, speed expert coming in. I'm really excited to hear him and, and meet him. I've never actually met him. Um, we have our old friend, Nicole Rodriguez, um, yeah. coming from uh, all the way from Poland. Um, wow. So really, really uh, excited about that. Um, I originally, when we were setting it up, we just assumed she would want to teach via Zoom and I should have known her better. Um, she was <laughs> like, uh, um, I'm going to come, right? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll buy, I'll buy a ticket. Um, I, I, that, so that's awesome. She's going to be here because her energy is just through the roof. If you've ever seen her coach, I know you know. Um, and then late edition, we just added Mark Fitzgerald. Um, former, Saw that. Yep, former strength, NHL strength conditioning coach. Uh, and he's going to be coming as well, all the way from Canada. So we have three guest speakers, plus Michael Boyle, of course, myself, Steve Biglow, Dan McGinley, and uh, Vinny Toludo. And so it'll be a good two-day event. Uh, we have a party planned at Lord Hobo Brewery right next door on Saturday night. So, you know, you know mark your calendars for that one as well. And so, Jealous. yeah, we're just going to be coaching away until that comes. So really excited. Awesome. Yeah, my I just looked it up. Mine's in Los Altos, San Jose, California, February 27th. So my first inkling was correct. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, still sign up. There's plenty of other events on the, uh, on the CFSC site too, but those are the ones coming down the pipe next. So yep. this was fun, Brendan. We get to talk every week now. Yeah. Every week. Let's go. Let's uh, I, everybody reach out with some questions or other things they want to hear discussed and we can go from there. Awesome. Well, this was a good first episode and uh, I'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. See you guys.